No, they aren't. This is a meeting. This okay, is where are the meeting? They should be up here. I'm not sitting back here. I'm here. I'm not sitting back here. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Business Function Committee meeting of June. Um, the reason for the meeting is very simple. Uh, last month, during the board meeting, the board asked the administration for some uh, possible spending reductions. They have ceded to the wish and, and given us a list of things. Ann has an entire uh, presentation to give us on the budget, which includes the spending uh, reduction possibilities, and we are here to talk about that and only that. So I want to thank the uh, administration for responding in a professional manner to the request of the board. I'm sure the additional workload was not easy on them. Anne, are you ready? I'm ready. Go. May 20th, where we ended up uh, with a proposed final budget, uh, looking at different scenarios, but the one that uh, we talked about, what we put on display, was an um, increase of 3.5% millage. Uh, a lot changed since then. Good news, uh, the Berks Health Trust premium rate was set on 522. We didn't have the data on 520. They set the rate on 522 uh, from 8.5%, which they set back in the winter time to 4%. So uh, health care premium costs went down about 346,000. Life insurance, we, uh, there's a small group of school districts that have our own little consortium for life insurance long-term disability. And uh, with the new provider, that goes down 10,600. Uh, we had a recent resignation. Uh, and reflecting uh, retirement savings on uh, what uh, replacement salaries are anticipated, I would tweak the budget, another 77,000 reduction in wages and benefits. Uh, Joe Bay uh, has been very diligent, and this time of year there's a lot of competition between vendors on Chromebook pricing, um, so he has brought uh, some of those uh, costs down based upon the quotes that he currently has. Projectors in the budget next year, these projectors were from 910. Um, they're failing. There's 35 in the budget for next year. Uh, he had more in there. There were some projects they wanted to do at the senior high auditorium, but the focus now is to uh, replace those that are failing. And then the following, uh, after that, there's about 115 uh, over the years, as they age out, they'll be replaced. Um, we'll be financing the Chromebooks with a capital lease purchase. Uh, just the, the whole program just makes it more affordable to build it into your budget. Uh, but because the cost of Chromebooks are going down, the estimate I have for financing, I brought down. We are getting still getting proposals. Today, at the 11th hour, Lenovo came in with the proposal was 30000 less for equipment costs. So this week, I'll be getting uh, financing proposals and adjust that number uh, down. Now, of course, the way the accounting of capital leases go, you record your source of revenue in revenue, and you record your equipment costs in equipment costs. What hits fund balance, or what you use on an annual basis, is your principal and interest payment. So because I brought equipment costs down, part of this is Chromebooks, I also have to bring the revenue. No impact on fund balance. Tuition changes. Um, we now, next year, will have two students attending the Ole Valley Ag Program, and we're, we're required, we pay the tuition. We're required to pay that tuition. It's based on Ole Valley tuition rate set by PDE. Uh, I got a notice from special ed. We had another student move in, and most likely will be placed outside of district. I didn't have transportation costs because it's possible we can do that transportation to a location that they're at. <clears throat> we did a bond refunding. It settles June 18th. Uh, 
the our financial advisor with CFM, Jamie Schlesinger, uh, gave me uh, the the numbers in regard to debt service expense reduction. We're taking uh, the majority of the savings, 119,000. Uh, well, not the majority, but a big chunk of it in 1920 because our debt was scheduled to uh, go up a little bit in 1920. So this will help that. But we're also borrowing an additional three and a half. Uh, so the additional savings, uh, it was upwards of 800,000 in savings, will be taken to offset uh, the additional debt for uh, the additional three and a half that we're gonna use for capital projects, um, which are slated to occur over the next three years. Uh, because the, um, we have this additional amount of money and the schedule is bumped out a year, the reimbursement from the state kind of gets shared by that and it, uh, for this next year it'll go down a little bit. Uh, major maintenance. Uh, <clears throat> we typically have around 600000 in the budget from the general fund. We have a commitment of $1.4 million. Uh, we had one of the biggest projects was a weatherproofing and seal various buildings. Uh, at this point, recommending uh, deferring that because uh, speaking with Rob Prezumi and even our architect to further evaluate the scope of that project uh, before we would you know, embark to move, move ahead uh, with that. And the Lausch, uh, we had money in for an HVAC unit. Uh, we probably will be okay if something happens, we'll just take it out of capital reserve. Uh, and then there was some recommissioning with Rob feels that it was a recommendation by the architect, but it doesn't really need to be done at this point. Everything's oper operating okay. So what remains to be funded out of general fund is replacing carpeting at Lorraine Jackson Wall in Brighton, playground fencing at Owatton, uh, Lorraine needs some playground pieces and uh, senior high has some rolling gates. So that is a big reduction out of the general fund. So in summary, what did we do? The revenue we re got reduced by 129,000. Um, expense got reduced by 1,153,000. Uh, big portion of it is wages and benefits and in the non-payroll related expenses, 719,000. So where that brings us to, in terms of a deficit from May 20th to, uh, before we talk about our, some recommended uh, budget reductions from 4.4 million to 3.4 million. And because you are unassigned fund balance, and that's this bottom line, uh, as a percentage of your expense cannot be higher than 8% in a budget that you adopt. The increase before recommended changes is down to about 2% from the 3%. Budgets that are higher than eight are not acceptable. You cannot adopt a budget that way. Um, we're assuming that commitments and assignments are the same and then no tax increase the unassigned is 5.33. So, are there any questions so far? So, Ann, when I sent you that report last week um, from the Commonwealth Fund, it indicated $24 million in reserves. And you indicated that that was accurate. So, the 24, did you say the 24 million or 24 percent? 24 percent. So percent. Pardon me? Percent. Yeah, so so is are all of our reserves reflected here? Do we have reserves anywhere else? This is our entire reserve. No, this is general fund. Okay. So and we have additional reserves outside of this. In our uh, yeah, and you've seen our audit report, we have capital right. project funds. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Which can only be used for capital okay. projects. Got it. Thank you. This is just detail for board members to, uh, you know, follow the totals that I provide on the summary. You know, 
35.3 million before a uh, that revenue without any tax increase, and then uh, before any additional recommended cuts, 78.8 million in expense. So we spend time uh, costing out uh, different things and well talking about different things as well. Uh, and what we're going to present here uh, is you know, some recommended changes to the budget. Um, and then I'll show the scenario, what that does to the bottom line, and then talk about you know, what we discussed. Uh, so, so and before you get into that, can I ask Dr. Phillips, what process did you guys go through in getting to these recommendations, and what is your intent in making this presentation today? Have you prioritized this? Are you just throwing these out there? What are you? What, what's your intent with this process? And then where do we go from here? In terms of, I mean, did you guys connect with your stakeholders on this, or is this just, uh, you know, you just threw everything up for an initial discussion? And I'll tell you where I'm coming from. I don't support the budget this year because I'd like us to take a year and really spend some time diving deeply into these issues. We have the reserve. We could maybe get some costs cut out now, some low-hanging fruit, so to speak, and take the year and really dive deeply into the impact of what these recommendations might be. Because we're two weeks before approving a final budget. So I, I'm just giving you my perspective before you answer, because I think it's unrealistic to think that you guys can make a decision in two weeks. I appreciate that. Uh, but we were tasked by the board to do that. So we sat down as an administrative team and for all intents and purposes brainstormed every and any content that we could do to reduce the budget. Um, we had discussions on the impact and what it would do. We had frank discussions on as educators are these things we want to bring to the board. Uh, is it educationally sound? Is it good for kids? Uh, when you say did we just kind of throw this together and prioritize, what you will see from Ann is our prioritizations. The recommended cuts are what you'll see at the end result of what we feel will be the less than, the least impactful on students and program. So, so in effect, everything you're presenting, you're recommending be cut. Yes. However, there will be other discussions you will see that we did discuss, and we felt that it was not something that we would bring to the board as a recommendation. Mm -hmm. But then again, it, it's out there if the board chooses. Uh, we will do what the board wants. But again, our recommendation initially was the 3.5%. We felt that was something that the, uh, would not for any program. Uh, we could move together uh, for one more year, as you said. Uh, we agree that there needs to be uh, planning. There needs to be some time to look at this. Um, so what we did in uh, the meantime was looked at things that we could do that would be least impactful on students and program, and specifically on bodies. Um, so, Fan, what's it? And we'll give you the budget reduction recommendations and what we've discussed as far as impact and the reason, the rationale why we did it. And then there'll be other discussions, other areas that we discussed and why we didn't bring it forward. Thank you. Yep. This year, uh, we have three long term substitutes uh, for uh, <coughs> mobile classes, they call them. Um, one at Reichton. I don't know the mobile class. Okay. It's a, a large class. We, we, what we've talked about over the last couple of years was we have what we've termed bubble classes. We've got a one grade level in a certain building that is above the recommended middle 20s of a classroom. So rather than going to 30s and 34th, we would bring in a long-term sub. Student-teacher ratio that we're talking about. Yes. So what we call the bubble student-teacher ratio to keep it in that 25 range. Uh, we've done that the last two years successfully. Um, again, we can keep it a little higher by not bringing these bubble teachers in, um, but it's a savings of close to three hundred thousand okay. dollars. I just didn't know what the bubble class. Yeah, it's a new term. Uh, so anyway, three long-term subs: uh, uh, one at Riften, uh, two at Jackson Jacksonville. Pardon? Well, at Brighton, uh, he requested in the budget a new, you know, two, uh, 12 
sections of fifth and sixth. Mm -hmm. Okay, current year it's just 11 and 12. I'm sorry, yeah. So next year, next year. Uh, the request was to keep uh, the long term stuff and then add another one. So it's 12 and 12. Uh, what we looked at was well, what if there's 11 sections of fifth and sixth grade? Uh, what does that do? It changes the class size to 28 to 29 versus 26 to 27. Uh, that 20 to 29 is still within the class size policy where at that grade level, you know, the higher, uh, keep it within the higher 20s. Uh, I did account for um, obvious, an additional pickup of seven students in grade five and six. So uh, if students would move in, and I base that on what has happened in the past with fifth and sixth grade, kids transferring, um, students transferring, in, you know, into the right and building. Uh, but again, we'll have to look at that. So 138,000. Uh, on grade two, we need to keep that at four sections. Uh, a lot in this grade two is, will be changed from four to five. Both of those, the average class sizes, is sections from five to four, I'm sorry, thank you. Average class size in second grade would be 23 to 25 across the district um, and you know within those two buildings. Jackson Hole grade four, uh, changing it to three sections, that long term sub going away. Uh, the class size will be 26. We kept that long term sub, the class size will be 20. And Owatton uh, currently has a class size of, in fourth grade of 26. So the total of those four positions, three long term sub, pulling out the new request is about 200. 62,000. Um, it's possible we could incur unemployment, uh, but we'll deal with that. Um, Why would we get unemployment for long term sex? You know, I don't know whether I, we may not, but I, I'm just not sure. Uh, you know, well, should it? a possibility? I let, yes, I do, as a possibility. And, and you're right, you know. We, we, Probably wouldn't, but um, you know, I wasn't exactly sure because the seat is very often. Well, the long term subs, we don't hire it, like from year to year. They might and I don't know how the do. unemployment office would look at it. So okay. that would be an additional 42000 which you know we would not incur. I have a question. But I just wanted to make you aware of it. Question was what's the population in Lorraine at Fort Reed? that you're talking about here are third grade, we're looking at fourth classes. And say so the population is 26 in a lot of it would be at 26 in Jacksonville. What's the range sitting at? They're within the numbers of the policy. But they haven't I'm going to ask you a question. Because Jacksonville tends to be one of the more economically impoverished schools in our system. I'm worried about being unfair to them by raising that population since Lorraine, they need to have more help at times. That's at uh, which grade level? Whatever um, you're looking for, 24. Thank you. Okay, the other um, item that we discussed was, you know, <coughs> decreasing the substitute teacher rates. Uh, Back in uh, February, March, it was decided, or maybe it was earlier, to increase them, uh, 130. And this was a survey done uh, mid-year among the school districts. And we increased our uh, substitute teacher rate significantly to try and bring down the, the uh, or improve the fill rate. Uh, based on data that uh, Christine Wheel and our HR director, in her, in her discussions with principal, it really has not had an impact. So, uh, you know, looking for ways to uh, you know, reduce the budget, uh, you know, this would be 42,000 by bringing it back down to a level of about 105, what we were currently at, but keeping our retirees still at the, the higher level. That was a separate action by the board. Question regarding this, it, we were told previously it actually did benefit us by raising the rates. So this seems counter to what we were told about a month ago on this item. Number two, in, in order to stay competitive, 
show me to be setting a rate in similar range as Muhlenberg, so at least we're picking off as many people as possible when we need help. I'm not saying we have to keep it 130, maybe at 110 or whatever Muhlenberg is, make sure we're staying in the market area. All right, and then that uh, could tweak that number, 42,000, you know, down about 12,000 or so. Other non-staff related budget cost saving measures, uh, we've done this in the past, uh, no library book purchases in 1920, that's 32,700. Uh, state level field trips, right now we have county, regional, uh, possibly be funded by student science Olympiad, TSA, that's $3,600. They don't, they have uh, paid advisors for those groups, but there's, they haven't been doing any fundraising. But, so this is an option that we're, you know, recommending. Marching band, uh, not attending away games. Uh, transportation costs for that are 7,250. Having our newsletter be electronic versus hard copy mail. Printing a postage in the budget is 20,650 for next year. Uh, employee funded or eliminating spring water cooler supply. Uh, 11,000, which the district currently pays. Uh, enforcing duplex printing, uh, possibly establish quotas and enforce no hard copy print with Chromebook devices. Joe Way and I and the staff are really trying to control, uh, you know, the amount of uh, printing that goes on. And a, a, a modest goal, 15% saving the paper cost. We spent about 35000 on paper, so that would be uh, 5000 Our goal is to save a lot more because we really do need to control all our printing and copying. Graduation fee, this is, you know, maybe Patrick or uh, Bob want to chime in on, on this one. We currently pay, uh, including rental for the Sovereign Center, the budget costs are uh, Post-season student-athlete meals. We do uh, provide them with money uh, when they are in our postseason. So the recommendation um, is to discontinue that. Uh, professional ground services. Uh, the, the contract for grooming and weed control, uh, we use Tomlinson Bomberger, that's 27000 And we discontinued that years ago. And what happens is the grounds crew, uh, it's difficult to keep up with the non-athletic tasks. And uh, what will happen is things won't look as nice, uh, but we'll just have to prioritize what gets done or we'll may re require overtime to keep up with the non-athletic tasks. Uh, student activity extracurricular fee, from 80 to 100, that would generate additional revenue of 20,000. Um, and remove the majority of desktop printers through implementation of follow-me printing. Uh, people are concerned about their confidential documents. They go to a can go to a printer, and their job will be there, but only released when they uh, sign in. Uh, in cartridge costs are 13,000 per year. So that's 170,000, 20,000 of that is on the revenue side. Uh, any comments? Yeah, I'd yes. like to look at these on a line by line item, please. Um, first on the library book purchase, no problem as far as not purchasing, as long as we have fresh supply in the books. The books that we're purchasing, are they electronic versions and can we check them out similar to the Reading system where the students can download them to the Chromebooks for those that are in fifth through 12th grade, and that way we'll preserve the integrity of the books for, you know, its perpetuity at that point. It's the first question I have. And there, there is both. There's both hard copy, and there's a program called Overdrive. Mm -hmm. um, that is it that, that libraries have um, now. Overdrive, the way it works, there's there's a set number of licenses for a certain book, and only so many kids can be can check out that license for for a period of time I know we use both as far as what the exact proportion is in terms of number of print versus 
number in overdrive. I don't have that figure, but I know we use both. We do have both. Yeah, I'm uh, thinking is maybe like going forward, Patrick, if we only looked at buying electronic versions for 5th through 12th for any book, because we're only going to buy X amount of books anyway of a certain title. Um, I mean, if you look on my phone, you'd see I download books continually. Um, I think it's a good way of saving paper. It's a good way of making sure we don't have a resource that fades away because, let's face it, as kids get a hold of books, they're not the most careful and tender in general with this, you know. Um, I think it's a good, just a nice thing. Um, second thing I had was the state level for the science Olivia TSA. I frankly can't um, be in favor of that item. I think this is a, an area where we're trying to encourage our students to excel. And I think that we would be degrading the program by not encouraging that. With regard to the transportation costs for the marching band, I am in favor of that. I think if we could maybe talk to the marching band to see if there's a way to encourage them to be more active on site so they could still have the, the opportunity to perform, but maybe not in the public forum beyond our school district. When it comes to the spring water, I'm wondering why we ever had spring water. So I have no problems with that. Just make sure that our current um, schools have active family systems that are working and operational. With regards to the electronic newsletter, I'm very much in favor of that. Just making sure we have hard copies available for a specific individual who might request that. With regards to the course to duplex printing, very much in favor of that. That's a yes for me. Graduation fee, I'm wondering if we could maybe break down with $25,000 covers, possibly. It, it comes out to seven, about $75. What is it? What's it for? Probably rental the building. Yeah, yeah so, the cost to do it so my next question is why don't we just bring that back in house? And I know we always have to worry about rain, but you know, maybe we can have X amount of population is in the auditorium, and then we're going to stream it into the gymnasium. But I think that asking students that have been able to be very, you know, they're working towards graduation and then asking them to pay the whole bill outside of maybe cap and gowns, I think is a little harsh, frankly. Jim, I, I seem to recall that, you know, we had conversations about graduation in the past that, as Bob Quinter used to say, that mm -hmm. when you consider the costs for setup, uh, you know, in terms of our own personnel that have to prepare for graduation, that the cost associated with renting the Santander Arena is a wash. Uh, it might be worthy to kind of look at that a little more carefully. Well, I think we have to look at it because $25,000 to set up some seats in the gym, and we already have seats already in the auditorium. All we do is tell the students to show up and put, I mean, we, we have these beautiful looking audiovisual aids here. We have an AV crew, our yeah, students it, are that. I mean, it makes sense, but I, I, I'm just recalling the conversation. I think we should investigate that before. I mean, we have a year to look at that cost item and see if we can make some modifications. The next item was um, funding athlete meals. I'm totally in favor of not funding athlete meals, um, unless there was a basis of them being on free or reduced lunch. That's the only time I would make an exception for that. Professional ground service, I wonder if it's worth keeping ground service in-house at all. I mean, that's something we should be subcontracting out at this point. I think it'd be worth investigating. Regarding the increase in extracurricular fees, I could actually see that going higher make, as, or making it graduated, depending on where you're at, whether you're in junior high school versus senior high school. And last, I'm looking at the desktop printers and the follow me printing. I'm totally endorsing your idea. I have a question about the extracurricular fees. Is that per activity or is that per year? For all? Per year. Per year for all activities. Mm -hmm. So if I'm only in one engaged in one activity, I pay $100. And if I'm in three sports or four sports, I pay $100. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I think the reason we did that originally, Dave, was because. <clears throat> We didn't want to have to bill a student at different rates because it was just simpler to say, if you're going to be involved in activities, this is the cost. And therefore, the more activities you do, the more of a positive it is to you. But also from accounting sense, from the administration in the high school, just saying, if they're participating, it's this. 
And once again, it's the free and reduced lunch. They don't have a fee imposed on them for participation. What's the current fee? Library book purchase. How much is that, like elementary, middle, high school? What's the divide there? The elementary are uh, approximately between $3,000 and $4,000, just off the top of my head. Uh, the junior high uh, is approximately eight to nine. Uh, the senior high is probably around um, uh, the same amount. Eight to nine? Yes. Yeah, yeah, between more weighted to the secondary. I mean, we had up the junior high the past couple of years because of their language arts program and their schedule and having more copies of uh, sure. books for the students. I don't, I'd have to look through, um, Julie gave me a certain information probably last year, I'd have to get that. And we talked before about central central copying, um, and, and for any teacher that wanted more than X number of copies that had to be done at central location on a copier where we would get a better rate, because I mean, copies are very expensive, and every every copy you make comes with cost for the round. How far are we from being able to implement a system like that for you? have more, where, where people use it and, and, and are required to use a central copy process? We strongly encourage it. We do have someone who does that. Uh, <coughs> teachers and staff do send over. Uh, there still is copying going on in the building, probably for last minute things. Uh, we encourage planning ahead. Uh, in the summertime especially, it's very busy. Uh, they send their jobs over here, but we do uh, encourage that. We also have uh, reports that are generated now um, that show who's doing a lot of copying and uh, work with the principals to reach out to them and say their volume is very high. You know, what are they doing? Uh, can they send those jobs you know, over here where we know they're going to go be duplexed? And so, and, and the reports also show who's not doing duplex. So. Uh, we are um, doing our best to kind of teach people uh, and change behavior. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm hearing a lot of encouraging people and can do this or that. I mean, how much is what well, we, then it would be sort of the next <coughs> step might be to establish quotas yeah. uh, in order to enforce. Do we currently have them log in a number when they're making any prints for copies? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And we also control the color as well. Um, is, is there any um, people using both sides of the paper? Because uh, that would cut the paper costs down in half. I mean, I know when I taught school, uh, I mean, my, you know, we did everything on both sides of the paper. And they were they were always they, they knew right away and they, they didn't balk about it or anything. Now I know there might be times when you know you can't do that. But I mean I remember looking, I don't know, someone had some kind of information and everything was just on one side of paper. And you know, you know again, I think that's a waste yeah. that's a waste of, of, of the money. Monthly, the monthly reports come to administration, they also go to each of the principals and it has everyone name. Their, what they did duplex, duplex, what they didn't do duplex, and how much did they get in color. So this is what we're using to say, uh, you know, you, why did you make so many color copies? Uh, we have controlled who can make color copies, uh, and why aren't you duplexing? What is it that you're doing? You know, so the question is, explain what you're doing, or do you know how to duplex? Yeah, because that's, I mean, like I said, you need both sides of the paper. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What you do is turn it over. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a whole lot of it. Yeah. So, from what I gather, uh, maybe the graduation fee needs more discussion. Um, so that may not be something. Since this is a committee, 
he's got a question, he can talk. Yeah. Sure. I, I just, there's some important stuff that looks to come later in this budget, some big numbers that you're talking about staff assignments. We're getting wrapped up in a paper conversation that's going to save a couple thousand dollars. I just want to make sure we're we'll get there. prioritizing. Okay. We'll get there. Okay, thank you. Okay, so those were what, after, you know, we talked uh, and what uh, we could recommend that has the least impact uh, on staffing uh, is this is where it takes us. Uh, what's going to follow is things that we crossed it out, we looked at, but we're not recommending at this point. Um, so uh, with those changes, uh, it brings us to a 1%, that's the max increase of millage that we could raise, where the deficit, uh, it's 2.9 million, and then some slides later, we'll talk about that. What, let's, let, let's break that apart. What are we using in fund balance, and you know, what, what, are, what is it going towards? Uh, so 2%, because of the, the limit established by Act 1, uh, unless you manipulate your fund balance, but I don't, you know, I, I can't support that. Um, you know, the 1% the is where we're at with those, with those cuts for a no tax uh, increase. So the other things that we looked at, and these were discussion, uh, and what's not mandated, uh, Regular classroom and, and other, other aids, they're not mandated. Special ed aids are mandated, you know, if they're written into the IEP, that's my understanding. And this is just to give you a perspective of what things cost. Uh, you know, we broke it down by path aids. Uh, you know, if you would, you know, not replace some of them, then you would have teachers having more duties, uh, principals spending all this time in the cafeteria. Uh, regular as math, reading, ESL, uh, you know, we have 37 assignments, that's 37 people. We, we employee management call them assignments. We have, at the elementary one um, library that splits her time. We have computer aids, excuse me, this is not, this is elementary and secondary. It's a mistake on my part. There's six, uh, there's one in each building. Uh, at the secondary level of five through 12, they handle a lot of the Chromebook, the elementary uh, iPads, and whatever system uh, teachers need in uh, the technology with the students. And we have a couple in school suspension aids, one at junior high and senior high. So these are critical positions in the district, but we talked about it, uh, looked at some scenarios, uh, but we're not recommending, uh, you know, changing this at this point. But as people do retire, we do evaluate uh, about the need. Excuse me, how many in-school suspension aids do we have right now, two? Two. One of the junior high and one of the senior high. Okay. And just coming back, I have a question here. <clears throat> so if you did the 1% increase with, <clears throat> with all those budget cuts, reductions, Okay, back to the, the 170 and then the 260 yeah. something. We're still like 2.5, like it's, you say our deficit then is still 2.5, one, like 2.5, 1, 2, 3, 9, 3 versus we're more in the hole doing it this way. Right, which one are you comparing me to? <laughs> For sure. Well, at two percent, we'd be two million in the hole. At one percent, we're two point five. So you're saying you would have to take this one because of the exceptions, or the because of the limit, right? Right. So we would have to take this one, and we would put us more in the hole. Basically. Well, essentially, it's at, at the same. Um, because what you're doing when you are reducing your cost, you are increasing your um, Elmstein fund balance. So it went from six million to six point five million. This is the number divided by expense. 
uh, and because your expenses are going down, this becomes larger. So the, the Act 1 says the unassigned fund balance divided by your expense cannot be larger than 8%. Right, so we're going to only have a 1% We still end up using um, fund balance because more fund, we use more fund balance. Right. Because a 1% increase yeah, generates 450000 of additional revenue. A 2% increase will generate. So we can't use the 2% increase. The way you can use 2% is if you increase your assignments or your commitments. <coughs> So going back, talk about the aids. Uh, we also talked about we have some special ed positions that are open, and we have two new ones in the budget for next year. Well, what if we, you know, try and have some regular ed aides move into those positions? Well, uh, that wasn't successful before. You know, the regular ed aides are valued, but. You know, what would that cost if we did it? Or what would uh, the cost we would avoid in hiring for these open positions? And that's uh, 240000 And are, are, are regular aides qualified to? They, depending, they would need training. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the kindergarten program, Again, our discussions were about what's not uh, required, not mandated, but we know how important kindergarten is. Uh, we know the governor and you know, the statewide about how important pre-K is. But again, uh, uh, half day, going back to half day, is taking lots of steps back. But we, we wanted to see what, it would, what the numbers would be. Right now, we have the Ready to Learn grant, uh, which funds one full day kindergarten class per building. Going back to half day, uh, it would be four and a half teachers. Uh, but again, what complicates things, you know, trying to do something like this, the half day kindergarten with curriculum would have to change. Uh, so again, this is not being recommended, but these are the costs associated uh, with it. Other programs are offered but not required. You know, all athletics, extracurricular, they're not required. But, okay, what does junior high sports uh, cost 105000 But 300 students would be impacted. That's the number I was given by uh, the athletic director. And we don't have a community sports program that I'm aware of where he told me, he said he did not, as the program that goes, operates at the 7-8 level. So you'd be impacting a lot of students. And again, we're not recommending that. Reduction of uh, high school athletic coaching staff. They have you know, big staffs on football and they have a freshman basketball coach. Well, again, we have a lot of numbers in football uh, in terms of students. You need the coaches for the numbers and safety. Again, you know, eliminating a freshman coach, then 15 basketball players would be impact. I didn't put any numbers to it because uh, at this point we're not recommending that. Strings and band classes, again, it's offered in a wonderful music program here, but it starts at the K-4 level with strings. Uh, you know, that, that's the cost. Uh, right in strings and band, and these are lessons for uh, small groups of students, and that costs 313000 um, And music, well, <laughs> so anyway, um, we looked at the senior high school uh, schedule for 1920. There's uh, the preliminary uh, schedule is out there. Uh, it's not complete with their extra duties or um, study halls. But in any event, uh, there was a re recent resignation, um, and we wanted uh, the principal to take a look at whether we don't have to fill that. Uh, I, at this point, I'm thinking it's doubtful. Uh, the subject area is math, um, but he is still evaluating that. 
as far as looking at We also looked at the electives, uh, AP classes, and uh, trying to evaluate low class size. Um, so several of the electives, bottom line, have low class size. So the way the schedule has evolved, uh, and it's the number of electives that have been offered, uh, and doing anything at this point would impact too many students. We, they wouldn't know where to place them. Uh, and I'm giving you just some examples of some of the class sizes uh, in, in, a, in electives at the high school. Guitar is an individual instrument. You only have four, four students. Get rid of it. I'm a guitar player. I have great sympathy. Plus. Right. And that's two uh, periods for the specific teacher. Uh, is that how your practice is? Um, and is that yeah. Would that result in a reduction? Yeah. Not if we just no, just not if one. You have to do it overall. And I, yeah, what extra duties would you be given? So, which leads us to what's important here about long range planning and to Mr. Chapina's point, you know, taking the time uh, to really look at things and uh, not that we haven't in the past, but. Uh, this junior, junior and senior high schedule have to be looked at. The enrollment's going to be going down. Those lower class sizes are going to be promoting at that level. So looking at the number of electives that are offered, set some minimum class size for these electives, and get them back to realistic and affordable sizes. Uh, you know, hopefully these things can be achieved through attrition, but we have to start now looking at this. And also, Taking a look at our elementary footprint, uh, should we go back to K to six? We have to look at our bus transportation system. You know, three tier to two tier. So there are some things, serious things that need uh, to be looked at to control uh, budgetary expenses, and we have to start now. And when you're looking at that, that exact one there, when we have courses that we can't have a substantial number of students. You know, we're looking at having a blended education where we're starting to look at online programs. I mean, if we have an AP course, we have six students that are requesting that course. It's not realistic to have a teacher there as much as still having that availability to. I think that's where we start leveraging the technology that we put in each child's student's hands. And secondly, then we could have just a teacher they could have as someone they could go to to ask questions to. I think that's how we kind of start filling that gap you know, some courses you do need a lot more hands-on in the classroom. Others, you could do it online very comfortably, I think. I think that's what we have to start just looking at leveraging there. You could with some of your AP classes. You could with some of your world language classes. Now, you know, some of these, like, Piano Lab, for example. Well, that's not realistic. You know, TV, video, production, electronics, yeah. they don't really translate into an online, you know, format. I think you have but to, you're right, there are some take that some you can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, along the way. And as stressed, that was the idea of the virtual program. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but remember last night at the discussion that we had with the gifted families is that you know they really valued having an actual teacher in the room. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I, you know that's what we do. I mean, we have teachers. We teach. I know, but when you get to that point where you only have six or eight students that are interested in something, instead of saying no, you say, okay, we can't do this, but we can do this and therefore you fill that gap or that need for the Spanish five or the French whatever you know I mean there's as Patrick said you know some courses just don't translate personally I think math courses usually need someone in the room I mean somehow there are chemistry courses online but I never figure out how you get the chemicals to mix together and have explosions but you know there is some way of working it out And this is a slide that I showed at a prior presentation on a student to a regular ed teacher ratio. And again, it illustrates that as our enrollment goes down, that 
ratio goes down, and that's why we have to look at schedules, because uh, if we're operating at an optimum district-wide average, or even at each building at this level right now, having it go down is really just, you know, costing the district more money. Uh, and that's why we have to uh, look at our footprint uh, and look at the senior uh, and the junior high schedules starting now. Do we have a comparison of the ratios to other similar size districts? Do we know roughly what that is? We, we can certainly get that. I'm just curious to see what that, how we compare. So, so how, how, how many students do we anticipate will be less than in, in, in 2019, 2020, 2020? Um, 2019, 2020. Mm -hmm. It's probably around 50 to 60. Yeah, 50. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's all the way through the district, or is it in a certain cluster somewhere? It's as the uh, 12th grade graduates at like pre-25 and then the kindergarten is coming in at you know, 275. Oh, okay, I got it. Mm -hmm. May I ask you? Well, you know what, and, and I think a lot of school districts are looking at pre-K because, it, I mean, it's very important in that a, a little child's brain is growing rapidly, they say, I think up until age five, it, as rapidly as it's going to grow. And, um, and that's why some school districts are, off, are offering pre-K. I know um, my, my own grandchildren, you know, are, are in pre-K. And, uh, yeah, two, we all have two, 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 two schools, two, two, two classes. I guess we could have more, right? Since we have so well, many the, kids coming the, in. The two classrooms. The two classrooms we have are funded through a, a, a state grant program. Um, currently, we don't have our own pre-K program, but we do have the, the two classes through our pre-K counts class. Yeah, I know it's at Etiwanton. Yes, the, the two classes are at Etiwanton. Oh, they're both at Etiwanton. Yes. So, would other students throughout the district go to Etiwanton, or must they be in the room? They would need to qualify for the program. And, and when you would, just to open it up to all students, they wouldn't qualify based on socioeconomic. Uh, but they could be from Jackson Wild or Lorraine. Mm -hmm. Yes, they but they have to qualify for the grant. But they have to qualify. Yeah. Okay. So how, how, how would a parent go about doing that if they, if they think they have a, you know, a, well, a the intermediate qualified. unit does a really good job of reaching out into the community as well as our teachers in that program. They do an excellent job. We have a night where the kids can come out, parents can come out. Um, they qualify for it, but again, that's a grant program that is not funded by the district, and it's limited. Uh, if you're talking pre-K through Exeter, that would require hiring and creating a program. Did somebody have a question? I did. I had a question about this chart here that you had up a moment ago. Uh, it says <coughs> regular ed teacher ratio. I was questioning, is that regular ed or does that include, so that doesn't include special ed, it does not include administrators or other professional staff, what's? Right, it just includes regular ed. I pulled out the special ed um, because I, sometimes that can skew, uh, you know, lower the number more right. because you may have 10 special ed teachers yeah. in the building, yeah, we understand that. So and I did not uh, include, that chart doesn't include administrators. I did show another chart from uh, the last presentation that was prepared by uh, a company forecast five, which includes administrators, but it illustrates the same thing, not only staff, but administrators as well. Okay. That's a, valid, that's a good point. Thank you. Yeah. So that's a, that, that's a K-12. K-12. Okay. Yes, Jill. Yeah, I so the deficit of revenue over expense, no tax increase, uh, 2.9 million. Uh, so what is, oh, I feel like I lost a sheet. Yeah, here we go. 2.9 million. Uh, so at one time use the fund balance uh, for resources that we need. Now in six years, we'll pay for these licenses again, but 
uh, something that, when I say one time, is not going to recur year after year. Uh, all these resources that we've talked about over the past few months uh, are needed. And um, that totals about 782,000. And they have been evaluated. I mean, our, you know, like I've mentioned, our uh, projectors are failing. The, the textbooks are so outdated. Uh, science and social studies are desperately needed. So we're using fund balance for great purposes there. Uh, wages and benefits increase year after year after removing those long-term subs and reducing the sub rate. It comes to one point. Uh, 655 million. Of that is about 375,000 for new special education staff, three uh, professional staff, two aides. Uh, the rest of it represents contractual uh, increases because there's uh, one year remaining on um, most of it on the teacher contract and one year on, on the support. Private school tuition, the increase from the estimate this year to next year is 576,000. I'll be meeting with the special ed uh, supervisors tomorrow to look at the rural life proposal and uh, what the impact to budget would be. Um, you know, as far as bringing classes in house and bringing the out of district placements back in, uh, trying to uh, see what that real number is and if there would be what the real savings would be. So we're meeting tomorrow morning. About that. So and when we see the 576, that's what the cost is without subtracting out where are the benefit is at this point, correct? That's the increase year to year. So without. going from this year 1.1 million in private school placement to next year, their estimate is at you know 1.6 million. So the Laurel Life program, what will happen is uh, the savings will probably come in transportation because we're also, it's costing a lot to transport the students. Um, it would also contain the cost where we would have more spots to put our students. Right, right. so I'm just, I'm just trying to see where we're at here because, sure. you know, that, that number just keeps growing for some reason. So last year, the, uh, Dr. Miller told us that they had saved, from the previous year, they'd saved $600,000. Is that correct? Hi. A couple years ago, they brought back, two years ago, yeah, a number of students from out of district placements, but the whole uh, profile seems to be changing and the level of, um, of the, you know, the, the emotional and the mental. Help me with profile. If it's more serious, more emotional, Maybe you two can. When you, when, you, when you talk about profiles, just the amount of, of need that the students have. Uh, when we try to keep our students in the least restrictive environment, we try to keep them in the class as much, in their buildings as much as possible. When we've tried everything we can, it gets to a point where we need to look for a placement to put them, uh, that they have their needs met. The lower light program they presented to us last month, uh, they would be able to meet those needs within our buildings. So there would be, a, beyond the transportation, there would be uh, an ability to meet our students' needs in our buildings, in our community, as well as have the ability to uh, not fill those slots initially with our students, have growth areas, where if a student is experiencing uh, some greater need in, quote, the regular ed setting, rather than looking for a placement outside, mm -hmm. that would attend the lower life program. And as you heard in the presentation, there their goal is to get the students back to regular education. So there'd be a, a transition figures where some of those students, rather than being held outside for a longer period of time, would be able to come back with supports from lower life, which again would then open up more spots for our students to uh, access if needed. Bob, I think one of the other things you, that was brought up was the fact that we'll make sure the students stay on our curriculum so that they're not going to be falling behind and then we have to play catch up and all that. And I think that's, that's a, again, that's a really good point. They're in our buildings with our curriculum. Their teachers will teach our curriculum. And then there's the added bonus of their staff being able to uh, triage, if you will, the students that do go out. I mean, we're not talking, you know, down the, the, the turnpike. They're maybe down the hall, floor down. They could be called to meet with the student and support them, keeping them in the regular classes.
so depending on how um, our meeting goes and uh, crunching the numbers, I'll report on Tuesday uh, an update to the budget. Is it still possible to get, <clears throat> if we approve more life in? Would it still be possible to get Laura Life in for next year? They, they've had discussions already with Laura Life. They're obviously wanting to put their program together as soon as possible, but yes, they've said that they can put something together if we had to get them this summer to work on it. Okay. We didn't vote on that last week? No, at that point, that was just a discussion from their end. There will be, the contract is on the agenda for the workshop discussion, <coughs> uh, but we wanted to, to really have this discussion tonight to understand budget impact. Um, you know, we're going to meet on the fifth to really hammer out some numbers, but the idea, idea is to cap where we're at and allow for mix, for some expansion with the lower light program. Now, granted, it, it's a cost. It, it's you know it's a dollar, and that's where it's going to be, whether we use ninety cents of it or thirty cents of it. However, the cap of it allows some expansion to where if we have three kids out and we need to send three kids out more, that's doubling the cost. We have three kids out and we want to put three more kids into the lower light program. There's no additional cost. Uh, yeah, just a millage impact, like I would share the different scenarios, 1%, uh, 0.3262 mil increase, generates about 450,000, um, uh, yeah, I think you'll understand that. Average additional cost per household per year, $35. Um, so <coughs> based on what we're recommending as far as the long-term subs and those other non-payroll related. Uh, again, this, going back to this slide, uh, you know, it's a $2.9 million deficit, uh, generating for a 1% increase, 450,000 approximately, a $2.5 million deficit use of fund balance uh, unassigned within Act 1, and then 5.9% but we still have assignments which we maintain as well as commitments. I'll review the commitments next Tuesday as well. Still maintaining commitment for capital. I'll review the whole capital budget again. Um, we have commitment for PEASERS. We're using about 300 some thousand of PEASERS in 1920 uh, to address that expense. So this is what it looks like right now. And I will update the board uh, on Tuesday, and then we'll uh, have to make a decision. The board will have to give directive on um, zero or anything more than somewhere between zero and one percent. Well, I, I think that if we're looking at 400 grand and change, difference to not get a tax increase if it helps people to uh, uh, stay in their homes. I mean, I, I think that's a small price to pay. And I get what you're saying with fund balances, et cetera, et cetera, but, but the, like, this is a problem that we've got to attack. Because those five-year projections you gave us are ugly. They're just flat out ugly. And the sooner we start, the better off we're going to be. So if we start this year, the savings come down, do they not? If, and how long is it going to take to, uh, you know, it'll take 1920 to really look at schedules. Uh, it's going to take a lot of planning, a lot, a lot of work, uh, and you know, implementing <coughs> 2021, you know, for the next five years, making changes. And um, the, when, when we look at the knowledge impact, the 108,000, is that the average um, for our, of our homeowners in the, in the district? That is this, the that average. That is the average, and that's the mathematical average. Yes. So if I could just walk a little bit through the process um, that we went through. And, and again, I will still say that the district has done a good job of budgeting through the years. We have a significant reserve in place. Reserves uh, are meant um, as a cushion 
and um, I, I believe that we ought to think about using the reserve over the next year and take a deep dive into these issues so that the changes that we make are truly sustainable. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of walk through just a couple of questions and these are just for my edification and understanding. So in the recommendations that were made for the reductions at the um, elementary school, uh, what were the discussions with the principals at the schools? As far as speaking to them, yeah. uh, this was strictly administrative team getting together and bringing cuts to the board. We, we did not reach out to stakeholders at this point. Okay. Um, if, if so, I mean, I did give them a heads up that this is a possibility. If the board directs us to uh, administer these cuts, then we would have to have meetings with them quickly. <coughs> yeah, I mean, again, and I'll, and I'll just say that again, I think it's critical that when you're, you know, to, to top-down leadership never works. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not Well, I just want to say that right now, this is not top-down leadership. We had a short amount of time to get to where we needed to get to. Right, but what I'm saying so is I wouldn't say that. Well, but what I'm saying is if we're forcing recommendations without having engagement from the stakeholders, it's top-down leadership. It's, it's, not, it, it's not an accusation against you. I realize the board gave me the direction. What I, I'm going to go back to my original point, which is that I really believe that we need to take a year and spend the time to really engage the, uh, all of the stakeholders in the district, not just the folks in the school, but the, the parents, uh, just much, much like you guys did last night with the gifted program. Um, I think there was good feedback and good interaction. So I don't mean that as a top-down way, not have been the best choice of words. I realize the direction the board gave to you, but I, any time that you give somebody a directive, even the directive that we gave to you guys that's just implemented on short notice without a lot of deep thought, you can't think deeply in two weeks, it usually doesn't work. And so that leads to my second question, which is the recommendations that you've made, how sustainable do you think they are over time? Well, again, the bubble classes themselves, the reason we turned the classes bubble is the bubbles eventually burst. Once you get into the Brighton and the, uh, specifically the junior high, the numbers don't affect the class size as much. Mm -hmm. um, as Ann said, the numbers that are coming into the elementaries are lower each year. Um, so we were, you know, Lorraine does not have a bubble. Their, their class sizes are in that recommended area. Uh, I believe Watton had one class that has been moving up. Mm -hmm. I believe it's it's the fourth grade this year that we were looking at is for a bubble. And Jackson Walt had the two. Our recommendation is to, uh, because the numbers would be over 30, I believe, at Jackson Walt, was right. to right. keep that class at about 25 uh, by moving a teacher. But that, that impact, again, will be lessened each year and then, you know, as the class sizes continue to grow. And then um, part of the process that we just went through was uh, financial. So when we uh, affect, uh, I don't know what the, the edu what the philosophy is in education around the impact of class size, but um, have you assessed the impact of class size on learning the educational process and then test scores. Yes, and, and the research will show both. There are schools that are having 40 kids in a classroom overseas and there are high scores, Singapore, Shanghai, things like that. Um, or United States, Pennsylvania doesn't show that. But again, our numbers are not going to the 30s. They're within the policies that the board has set. So we, we did some effort to try and stay within our numbers of 25, 26, 27. And then just uh, the final question that I had was, there is nothing in here from administration in terms of cuts. There's nothing in here significantly from the junior high, and there's nothing in here from the senior high significantly. And I'm just wondering if, you know. Those discussions were had as well. Uh, when you talk junior high and senior high, the majority of that impact would come from the dissolution of the dissolution so this evolving of the electives. I mean, you know, you're talking about uh, cuts that would involve people. So that's one of the reasons why we try to uh, avoid doing that at all costs. So then there were, I mean, there, there's an entire administration here. I, there, I didn't see anything in here from any administrative department. 
Well, again, we're, we're, we're not that heavy when you when you say you want to cut administrators. Um, I'm not saying that, I'm just asking if you I'm saying we, we, we analyzed it, we looked at it. Um, specifically, if you're talking about the principal job at Jackson Hole, that was discussed. The issues that go on in a building, the support that's needed for student staff and building, we feel that the position needs to be filled. So that was that was discussed. Well, I, I know I made that recommendation, and I, and I think in the long term, if you're going to really look at how you're running, if you could take the school out of an educational perspective and look at it as a business, you know, I think over the next year it would be worthwhile to look at what other schools might be doing in other parts of the country. I don't, I, I'm not sure that what happens in Singapore is necessarily going to work here, but you know, maybe what happens in uh, San Diego might have an impact here or whatever. So and, and that's certainly something we could look at, but again, with all the issues that go on in the buildings and, and the myriad of mental health issues, security issues, just the comfort level, the support for student staff and community. Uh, we did look at that, we talked about that, and we feel that that, in the transition phase, um, still is a need. So, but nothing in the administration building here. No, no staff in all the departments in this building would be considered to be redundant. Redundant, no. Needed, I mean, we, you know, there are two areas that, that uh, we show a need in, in literacy and math. We have coaches for those. Um, we're trying to improve our scores. We're trying to improve what we do for our students. Um, there could be a reduction there, but it would suffer in the program that we're trying to do. Gentleman has a question. Uh, I actually have a couple, but I think I'm wearing okay. my welcome to this topic. Uh, when will the tax break afforded the uh, could, could you, building could you the in Exeter? Oh, no. They want you to talk to the mic. Let me get to the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Great. Thank Just you. Pull through. Just Please grab the, uh, push the green button and he'll be able to talk. Thank you. I might start to sing a song. <laughs> no. <laughs> when does the tax break given to the Exeter Commons properties end? Does anybody know? There, there is no tax break. Oh, the, uh, all those. Well, I thought there was initially. No, wait, just let me talk. I thought there was initially for a period of time, and maybe that time has now expired. They have um, been assessed taxes, uh, and once they were fully developed, they were assessed their full value. Uh, there was a TIF, uh, tax incentive, tax increment financing, which was for funding the road improvements that the county, township, and school district, uh, we paid a debt on that. But all the... Uh, all the buildings in Exeter Commons are paying their fair share of school taxes based upon the assessed value of those properties. That's correct. Okay. Um, on the uh, page entitled Other Staffing Impact Discussions, I was just doing a little math to try to understand it. And um, if you look at the library, a one assignment, which would be one position, that would mean that person's salary of sorts would be 10,000, gross income of 10,850 a year. Is that what that means? That number represents, and that's a part-time position, it would represent a school year employee working 181 days, plus this, the Social Security and retirement that the district is responsible to pay for. So these are all uh, our costs. Yes. Net yeah. of the reimbursement from the state. So matching, I mean, matching shares and so it's, forth. It's pretty much a total com uh, a compensation. Uh, so um, it seems, I mean, the numbers, so, so then if you look at the elementary computer aids, six assignments, that would translate to $43,500 and change per year per assignment. Is that, that that's it's correct? Math. They're full time. They are full time, and uh, a family uh, benefit uh, health care is twenty two thousand dollars. It's happened. <coughs> and then the regular ed, math, reading, ESL, etc. Um, do they all get? They're all. They're not all. Part time or are they all part time? 
kind of a mixture of spots? Yeah, the majority uh, would be uh, majority would be part time. It just seemed that it didn't um, divide out the number that made any sense to me when I did it. I think it was about eleven thousand and something like that. So. Um, the fund that uh, you're taking the uh, one-time uh, payment out of, um, how much is in that fund, roughly speaking? When you're saying, when I talked about the deficit and the 781000 Yes. I think it was... Um, well, let's go back to the final slide. Our fund balance in the general fund... No, that's not the one I was looking at. Uh, I know what you're talking about. Uh, it's the, uh, the I'm sorry, I forgot the page number. No tax increase. That's correct. Is that the one you're looking at? Yes. That's yes. The one I'm looking at. So what I was trying to explain or kind of break down for everyone is the deficit of revenue over expense. Expense is more than revenue by 2.9 million. So what's causing that? Well, 781,000 of one time, they're not non-recurring, plus wages. No, I, and, I understand that okay. part of it. Okay, where's it coming from? Yes. Oops. And how much is in the, in how, how much is in, in the In this slide, last page, uh, after using the deficit, there will be a song by commitments. <laughs> this are commitments towards uh, capital projects. Uh, future retirement increases, PESERS, and uh, assessment value, appeal reductions. Uh, we have assignments for future uses of fund balance. Uh, it includes the deficit for 2021, which I'm projecting. What I'm asking so 15 is, million is how coming out of here. The, how much is in the fund? 15 million point eight, the bottom line. Of which the, right of which the one time use of the fund balance on that other screen was a 2.8 million and change. The 2.9 million, so at the end of this year, and I'm, I don't have that on this sheet, uh, there's 2.9 million more. So at the end of 1920, it'll be 15.8 million. Okay, if we're to Yes. Thank you. And the, uh, the state budget is not yet do no. you have any sense of how this might change, you know, um, based upon what we are sensing from Harrisburg right now? Do you have any insight? Is there likely to be any impact at all on that one? Well, I, I'm thinking from what I've read so far, they do want to get the budget done. Uh, I, the only piece I don't know yet, and before Tuesday, I'll reach out to Hannah Barrett of PASVA whether the ready to learn will be rolled into basic subsidy. Um, but at this point, the expectation is uh, they want to pass the budget and support it, and we'll get the amounts that, uh, the small amounts that, uh, that's it in for the education budget. And, that, and I think that's important. When we initially heard in October, there was talk of all this extra money coming in. Right. And at this point now, it's, it's almost flat. But well, it's a, it's a good once again, we once again we fell for the state thinking that they were going to properly fund school districts. No uh, charter school reform that will benefit school districts at all, which is it just becomes so discouraging year after year. Um, There's plenty of money for them to have junkets overseas, though, right? Mm -hmm. I just had one other question related to the uh, age, which I know are not on the table. But when you um, increase class size, when you have kids being pulled out of class for individualized you know, learning or whatever, um, do you foresee the, the need then for additional aids to handle that work if you have a larger sure. class size? Well, one, of the, one of the reasons why we, when you look at cost-benefit analysis, it would not have made sense to cut the aids and then up the class sizes. But when we look at that, it, it's a one-two student ratio um, improvement from a 25 to 27. So at this point, we're not seeing the need for that. But we'd be looking at that. And if push comes to shove, yes, we'd have to come back to the board for a much to help. No worries, Bob. They're, they're um, not 
used for clerical work, correct? No. They are specifically they are to work with students. To work with students. Yes. What are the second grade? <clears throat> what are the second grade class sizes at Lorraine and Jackson for next year? Yeah, you have a breakdown of all the classes sizes, right? At least at this point, can you show that so we can go? Through? Again, they're within the. I know, but I think it's good to try to keep them equal. Oh, sure. Sure, there you go. That's, that's the projected numbers. All right, numbers where they are now. I basically, uh, you know, down below is each Lorraine. Um, now, I don't, we don't have the kindergarten numbers, but based on having four kindergarten teachers, 18, uh, 21st grade, 23 second, 24, uh, third, 24, fourth. And there's a Watton uh, and Jacksonwald and Rankton at 12. It's between, like I said, between 26. Um, some may have 27. Uh, reducing it to 11. That's where you get the uh, 28 to 29. And what's our cash for business grade? 30? Yeah, the policy reads high 20s. And as I said, I increased each of those class sizes by seven, uh, assuming based on prior three years, seven more coming in. And again, you know, if there's a huge change, then we'll have to address it. So in the healthcare setting, when we look at uh, uh, the treatment of a person, do something called risk adjusted um, based on the acuity of the, of the patient. So how sick are they? So do we take into consideration sort of any risk adjusted when we're bringing a kid, a new child or a new student into a classroom that might require more than, than what we normally would provide. offer? I mean, do we do, is there some that's sort of done, That's done through the director people's that's done through the pupil services department. They will sit down with the family. We'll get all the paperwork from the other district. They'll make a uh, determination to where to place that student that best meets his uh, individual education plan. So, but if, uh, if, you, if you have a more challenging student that might require, like we heard last night, we had a, the, the one guy last night talk about the kid who sat on the yes, desk the yes. whole time. Um, that, yeah. that's, that's a determination where typically a student like that may already be placed somewhere. Um, so they would stay in that placement if it's effective. Uh, we would try to bring the person, we'd speak to the parent, try to look at the student and see if we could bring the person into the student into the least restrictive environment and do the best we can for that student. Ultimately, if they have that level of need, uh, we are looking to, to place. Um, and I think that's, that's the, the beauty of the Lower Light program. We have that as an option rather than sending students outside our district. Uh, we can keep them in our district with our curriculum, as, as previously mentioned, um, and then have that, that buffer zone where they could go in and out as needed. And you know, right now, our students aren't seeing the inside of the building. They're being transported to a placement. There's a transition period of bringing them back. Most placements don't have a lot of transition services. So you're out of sight of a district, you come back into the district, and it's, it's kind of a new world. So we do the best we can to, to soften the transition. That program will help. But yes, you're correct. That, that is not in a meeting, an entrance meeting, if you will, with the, the IEP team. So that, if I could ask just one more question, this is more sort of forward thinking. Um, you know, this was good work done on short notice. How would you guys approach this same task over the course of the next year? What would your, what would your plan be? Well, when we discussed that, um, there are some things on there that Frankly, we looked at, and, and we wouldn't want to look somebody in the face and go, guess what? We're eliminating these 10 positions. Giving forward notice, if we start looking at it next, this fall, well, at this summer, we could start bringing to the table, as you mentioned, talking to stakeholders, saying, one example is Mr. Campbell, we're talking about that math position. Having discussions with the principals ahead of time to say, when you put your schedule together, we're cutting three teachers across the board. How is that going to look for your schedule? Having those frank discussions saying, you know, we may be reducing staff, 
it's an opportunity to start looking. We'll support you as best we can to, I mean, it's not a good conversation. It's not what the ideal is, um, but giving people two weeks notice to find a new job is not something we wanted to do. Right. Yeah, I think what I'm saying is we're not going in with a preconceived notion. No. We're sort of going in generally to say, listen, we have some real financial challenges over the next couple of years. Oh, yeah. And rather than us telling you what we're going to do, we're going to give you the scenario. Yeah. We're not going to tell you that you have to get rid of that person, that person, right. and that person. But, but you know, I'm just trying to see how we would, you know, because I do think. Understood. Well, I think we need to bring the teachers into this as well, though. This is not a discussion that would happen from just administration. The teachers have to have input on this. What, what is it going to affect? You know, your class may go into the 30s. If that's something that, that would you know cause us to do this, how can that be done? Um, I think at some point we need to get parents involved, and in, in where do they want to go? I mean, this is obviously everyone is concerned about taxes, but there's also preserving a, a good education, so saying what they want to do, uh, how comfortable do they feel with class sizes? One less teacher. We talked about last night enough that last night they were concerned about one cut in, in a specific area. Um, the drastic cuts that we're looking at in the next few years are much deeper than that. Um, so having that frank discussion, uh, quite frankly, having budget forms. And when we talked about you know really having people come out and talk about that. The other step is looking at it in our business community and seeing how much they can support. I mean, I know everybody has hands out. However, if they can support some of these programs through EITC or whatever the, the, the grant funding we can provide, maybe to preserve some of these programs that would be on the block. Uh, it, but again, it's, it's not something that you do in two weeks. It is something that would be started right after this budget and look at frank discussions that this cut's going to be made, all the stakeholders at the table, and, and it's going to hurt. This is what we need to do. Yeah, and I think to kind of add to that, you, know, you asked the question about, you know, you didn't see anything in terms of secondary um, as far as, you know, potential recommendations. And a lot of that was because a lot of the discussions that we had around secondary weren't things that we felt like, you know, in a week, you know, we could go to a principal and say, you know, this, but, you know, you look at our schedule, and the, the, you know, the structure of the secondary schedules, I think there's an opportunity there engaging department chairs, engage, you know, engaging administration, engaging, you know, community to, to talk about, you know, we love choice and we love electives, maybe there's a way to offer them rotationally. You know, maybe we, you know, within a certain department, we offer certain electives one year, the next elective, you know, the next year, and, and you know that way, you know, our numbers are a little bit. It's not, you know, having some of those dialogues, but you definitely need, you know, the time over the course of the year to have those conversations. We have floated those ideas to both Mr. Campbell and Mr. Flam, you know, already. Um, I've had some experiences in my past looking at a high school schedule in particular, and that's, I mean, that's that's something I'm happy to work with administration on, but it's definitely something we need time. Know, the year to, to work through because it does impact lots of stakeholders. And we, we did follow a process that I've done in, in my previous district. I mean, it, it's not easy. We put things on the board that we weren't comfortable with, um, brought it to the, to the board. Uh, but as, as Patrick said, it, it's things that would take a longer period of time to look at. It. But it's also uh, a philosophy change. Are, are we going to offer 31 sports? That's a great, I mean, Extracurriculars, not just sports, music, art, they do great for students. It's something we would never want to take away. But can we afford that? Uh, we talked about all these electives with these small numbers. Yeah, we can, we can do some of that through virtual, um, but hard decisions, is that something that we can do without? So yes, I think that's a, that's a long-term plan. That would be some hard discussions with a lot of people. Uh, maybe small group, starting with the sports people, the music people, the art people, the you know, the, the AP staff, the AP parents, whatever the case would be, and then bringing them together to a bigger group, uh, say, okay, we've got some hard decisions up here, put it up on the board and go, what can extra live without? Thank you. I have a couple questions. Um, Dan, have you calculated what the reduction of income will be as the townships now acquired the giant shopping centers in the process of that? Well, that probably will not take any reduction take place until 2021. Uh, they'll have to go in for uh, appeal it in August and it'll be effective 7 1 20. Uh, right now, the assessment on the entire property 
top of my head, excuse me, the tax, 125,000, but some of it will remain taxable, I'm assuming, because uh, the uh, businesses that are there, I know there's just a few, um, I'll have to see how that plays out. Uh, but I, it's not in the 1920 budget, but I'll have to watch it for 2021. With regards to look at the elementary schools right now, there was a suggestion later in the document regarding reshaping the allocation of schools to K sixes for four of them. And I'm looking at popular uh, teachers 16, 20, 24, but then I'm looking at right to going out in 22 classrooms. I'm wondering why we need an assistant principal there right now. And assistant principal at at right at right. I'm just, I'm just putting that out there because I just asked him. Uh, I understand, and, and I'm going to come back with the, with the same discussion that I have with Mr. Uh, Jopina. The amount of uh, issues that take place at that higher level, fifth and sixth grade with the students, um, they're transitioning into the first year of not being with the same like peers for the last five years. Um, the uh, onset of maturity and what that brings. Um, there are issues in that building that, that keep them hopping on a daily basis. Um, well, I guess I'm, refer I'm reflecting them back before we had Riften, and we were all K through six in each one of our buildings. And at that time, there was only one building that actually had an assistant principal. All the other ones were running with a single manager in charge of the building. So I'm wondering, you know, I think that's something, if you're looking at reshaping, that might be one of those places that might be hard because we, when we built right, it was built as a K-6 building. Yeah. Sure. Well, and I think it, it, as we've been discussing here, I mean, I don't think anybody's, anything is off the table once we start having discussions about realignment, reduction. Mm -hmm. Again, I think that needs to be um, discussed with all stakeholders to see how we feel about that. But yes, I think that would be something that we could look at. Jim, are you asking like what changed? No, I'm not asking what changed. I'm that, asking, would, that, would, that would make no, it. No, I was asking for why we have an assistant principal there. Yeah. When we're looking at looking at K through 4, having a similar amount of classrooms in the building. That's why I was asking the question. And I can understand if we're having a very unique population where they're blending three student bodies together, why you might need that assistance. But if we broke it apart, you might be down to only one administrator okay. in the building yeah, at that time. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Sorry. Question in the back. Yeah, I just, I would encourage you before you start to think about putting 30 kids in a classroom or 32 kids in a classroom, that you would go sit and visit a regular ed classroom that has 32 kids in it and the kids that are coming in from special ed that are mainstream because that's quite a difficult group to handle. So visit it. Go visit it. I was going to say that as well. Where do we move from here? Like, so <clears throat> is this what the business um, functions committee will recommend? That this is our rec your recommendation? Um, yeah, because I'm not comfortable with 28 to 29 kids in fifth and sixth grade. I'm for whatever works, because because I I've got news for you. I'm looking at this very simply in a very simple manner. We have an unsustainable system at the moment. Okay, in five years. $5 million deficit. The sooner we attack that, the quicker it comes down. It's unsustainable as it is. We've got to do whatever we've got to do. Well, I, I kind of disagree with you, Mr. Gill, because we're here to educate students. If we're having 28, 29 kids in a, in a classroom and they're not getting educated, then we're wasting our money. I mean, I would rather uh, see productivity than stagnation. I don't know about you, but that's, that's more important to me. And, you know, the, 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 the only thing that we have going for us is that we're a public institution. And everyone has the equal right to come here to this school, no matter how poor they are, no matter how rich they are, and they can get a fine education. I was just reading about some student who um, I was in the prison paper, he came from Mexico. Very poor, very poor family. But he, he was very good in school and he's now going to be 
uh, working to the adopter. So that is that is where that is what what public education is all about. And I think he was he went to Reading, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Yes. So you know most people have a very negative concept of Reading, the Reading School District. Myself, having taught there, I do not have a negative uh, concept of, of education in the Reading School. Well, that's my skill. I agree. I think we're going to um, bring down the value of our education if we have that many kids in class. Okay, well, then, what we're going to do then <laughs> is continue to just raise taxes and just raise taxes and keep piling on and keep piling on, and people are going to leave. And that's going to, you know, that's going to lead to more taxation. <laughs> because we can't grow our way out of this. It's not going to happen. Okay, I mean, the township can have all their plans, but that's a 10 or 15 year plan down the road to bringing uh, industry or bringing businesses in. So that means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. We know Robin Hood, the state, is not right again. We'll be lucky if they don't take more next year. Um, well, we need the federal government to step up. There's no mandate for that. There should be. There used to be. You know. There's no mandate in the Constitution for that. When you mentioned earlier about the 7th and 8th, Grade sports. I think that we need to examine that area first. I think that we'll find there are seventh and eighth grade sports available for students in baseball. They're definitely available in soccer. I'm not sure about other sports, but that's like that's a low hanging fruit. I think one of the things hey, we Jim, need, I always just caution you to to understand that not everybody can afford to participate in some of those. I'm just throwing it out there. there. You know, I can tell you that I, my son is just in a swim program. When all through this summer, I'm going to drop close to a thousand dollars on it. Okay, that's a lot of money that a lot of people, you know, I, I'm going to struggle to pay for it, but a lot of people struggle to pay for that. So, so just I'm just going to say that it's not as low hanging, might be low hanging but for, for you and me. They are community, they're other community other programs. I'm talking about the community, I'm not talking about going and doing traveling teams, I'm not talking about going out the special swimming program. I mean, granted, you have to join at Crestwood, but when you join, when you're looking at Baseball, I mean, we have the extra baseball club. They're playing their, I forget what, Babe Ruth or whatever leagues, senior ball. When you're looking at your soccer, they typically limit their season because of the fact they're going up in age and they can't play the two seasons at the same time. Um, when I'm looking at high school, there's a freshman team. Do we have a JV team? Why do we need a freshman team? Things like that. If you're, I mean, that used to be only JV and varsity. We used to have freshman teams. At least when I grew up in Philadelphia, it was JV, varsity. That's it. You're good. You're not. You're not you're the same age, Jim. I had freshman teams. You had freshman teams. We had no teams. And we had some of the eighth grade teams. So okay. the only thing I'll say about that is that was something we discussed. But when you talk about impact on students, it, it's something very it's difficult. Half to, it's half the students at the junior high school. I think when we're looking at student population though, even if we grow our classrooms, I think one of the things we've really had in the past that was very strong was the aid system where the aid was working three classrooms or whatever the ratio was. And that was where we were able to make sure that we were getting in there and working one-on-one -on -one with students that might need a little help with reading or whatever the subject material was by having that child coming out of the call room or whatever it was. I think as long as we keep, I think the aid system is very important. Though it may not be mandated, I think that's where we are able to then reach that student that's having a challenge. I think one of the things we didn't discuss tonight was the gifted program. Um, I'm still very concerned about that in a bigger sense because I look at the gifted and the high achieving students and I look at mainstreaming and I look at grouping and I sometimes think that we're now taking the students and putting them in a place where they may start getting bored. And once they start getting bored, they do what's required, and they don't excel, and we start downplaying their excellence that they can have. So I think we really need to keep looking at that beyond just someone who gave a test psychologically and said, that child's gifted. And I think that, that happened last night. I think there was a good discussion about the program. But I guess I want to balance, we're going to cut sports, but we're, we're going to add to our gifted program. I, I, think I would cut every sport before I cut my gifted program. I'd, write, I'd rather keep my gifted program and every one of my academic programs where I cared about one sport. Just like I'd rather keep every one of my arts programs where I cared about one sport. But that's a personal view. Mr. Brady, I wish you would speak 
I would get rid of every sport program before I got rid of my arts programs or my academic programs. That's where I'm at. Well, I think there are, I mean, I'm not that I want to get rid of the sports, but I'm saying that's my priority. Well, it's academics, it's arts, it's sports. That's how I've always been. I, I think there are some, there are some students who sports is very important to them. I mean, let's face it, you, it's teamwork. I mean, sports isn't just, you know, like playing golf. It's you and the you and you and you only. But uh, you know, kids kids do love um, competition. They love to get they they learn to get along. They learn to be do teamwork to work together. They get scholarships. Um, so, Pat, would you rather keep your AP calculus or would you rather keep your lacrosse team? That's what it comes down to eventually. I mean, that's how it comes down. Would you want to keep your AP calculus, AP bio, AP chemistry? That's what it's going to come down to when Jerry gets through this or someone else in about three to four years. Do you want to keep your lacrosse team? Do you want to keep your field hockey team? Or do you want to keep your AP course? Well, I, I mean, think, that's where you're going to with this. I think we need to make sure that we have good school board members that understand the value of everything that we do here. And that's what I put in there. I mean, that's, that's why I got on the board. And that's why I'm here. It's all about the kids. It, so, it, it, yeah. is, about, it is about them doing the best that they can. You know, whether they're, I mean, look at the people that are in sports and that some of them are making millions, multi-millions. I mean, all you gotta do is Golden State, <laughs> hundreds of millions they're making, right? <laughs> so, it, you know what? It comes down to let's provide what we can for the district, for our students, because they're, they're the next generation. And we need an educated society. That's, I, I, would, I would hope that you would agree with that, Mr. That's why I said academics, academics arts, sports, because I think you can do teamwork in a classroom. Definitely. There's no reason you can't do teamwork in a classroom by assigning projects where someone has to work in a group of three or four. That's learning how to work one-on-one -on -one and dealing with personalities and the fact you have to deliver a product. I agree with you. Agree Not with that you shouldn't get rid of sports, but I'm just saying, priorities-wise, in my house growing up, in my house today, it's always been A, B, C. You know, if I had to tell our kid whether they're going to play sports or study, you're definitely going to be studying every day of the week. Because that's the priority. You're going to go somewhere by studying, Sports, if you're good enough, you'll get there. But the good thing about the sports these days is that students have to maintain a certain, you know. That's not the point here. It's about no, cost. Yes, it's about cost. They, 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 they will, you know, they will step up to the plate and, and, and get their work done so that they can play sports. It's about money, Pat. Yes, Jerry, yeah, it's I would refer money. you guys, there was an article in the Talon magazine or the Talon newspaper written by a uh, an athlete named Peyton Halsey, who's actually going on a four-year scholarship to Northwestern University in Chicago that talks about the value of the teamwork that she developed with her teammates over the last four years, both on field hockey and lacrosse. I would just recommend that you read that because I thought her perspective was interesting. I know we're probably getting ready to close up. I do want to thank the administration for the work that they did on short notice. Um, I appreciate the public that was here this evening. I think we have a, uh, a long way to go in terms of instituting this you know, stakeholder communication and this community discussion. I believe we have it within us to re-envision uh, how we do things in a way that helps us to cope. And I don't think we're gonna solve the problem because I, I don't, we just don't have, the only way to solve this problem is to continue to you know, lump significant increases on the backs of our taxpayers and those of us who just went through re-election and walked these neighborhoods heard from a lot of people particularly those on fixed incomes that they're not they don't they don't think that you guys are um, you know doing things wrong they just want to know that we're doing all that we can to to reduce as much of the cost as we can they understand the value um, and the reputation of the school district affects their property value. Um, so they don't want to damage or destroy the school district's reputation because they're really going to sort of create some self-inflicted problems for themselves when it comes time to sell their home. So I appreciate the work that you guys have done. I realize that there's a lot of pressure on you, but we have to make sure that we're engaging the community in this discussion because I think part of it is also just helping 
our community to be more aware of the issues and challenges that we're facing. Dave sent out the PASBO report this week. PASBO, you know, is a lobbying organization for, you know, school administrators, so there's a certain skew to that perspective. Um, it paints a dire picture. We're not the only ones dealing with this issue, so we, we know I see uh, uh, Rob Scaboria here this evening, the superintendent of the Y Missing School District. Uh, y Missing is probably dealing with some of the very same issues that we are, and I know that Bob is very, uh, Bob and Patrick are very heavily involved with BCIU in terms of, you know, collaborating with other districts and trying to, to bring those experiences together. I, I really think we can accomplish a lot over the next several months, and I think this was a, a really good start, but I think if anything, after tonight, we just realize how hard the decisions are going to be and how important it is to have the community involved. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, that's every, oh, no, I just, I, before we wrap up, I mean, I, I'd like to have a better sense of where we're, we're going uh, for the workshop meeting next Tuesday in terms of what the proposed budget is going to look like. I mean, I, I know it's still subject to debate, but from the, the administration's perspective, where do you see the recommendation coming in terms of what you're suggesting that the board? I think what you said. What Ed presented uh, with the recommended cuts would be the one percent increase, but that would include everything that was recommended. Um, just to, just to, to recap, the budget recommendations would be the bubble class reductions, which would increase class sizes, um, and it would be the the list of uh, if you want to call it uh, other non-staff related measures. That would get us to the one percent increase. I'm sorry. And the substitute decrease yeah. as well. Yes. Yes. That's yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's it. Yes. So the one percent would bring would bring us yeah, would bring us would bring us down to the one to one percent. Yes, those cuts would bring us down to the one percent. And so, how much would that be uh, as far as in dollars to the um, dollars and cents? It is one percent would be thirty five dollars and thirty three cents for the year, roughly two dollars and ninety four cents a month for the average uh, cost, which is the one hundred eight thousand, I believe. Correct, Ed? Correct. Well, I would say no more McDonald's. Thank you. I know I came in late, so I didn't get to, to see most of the meeting. Uh, a little belated as my, my uh, twins graduated in a couple days. I really just wanted to come in and say thank you uh, to the school board members. I know you have a, a tough job and a tough decisions to make. Thank you to the administration. Uh, thank you to the staff members, uh, all the employees here in the Exeter Township School District. Uh, my wife and I have been very lucky to live here 21 years. We've had three children now come through the system. They've received an excellent, well-rounded education. Uh, they've been pushed academically. My daughter was, was very interested in science, had great teachers here uh, that, that involved her in, in, in clubs and activities and, and helped her succeed. Uh, she's now studying chemical engineering and, and had a great first year. Uh, my sons, uh, as Mr. Japina knows, are very passionate about uh, sports and, and, and swimming and water polo. Uh, I want to thank the district over the last 10 years for, for helping them have an opportunity to uh, have success and participate. Uh, so again, I, I know this might not be the perfect meeting, just wanted to say thank you for all you've done uh, for, for my children, and I wish you the best. I know these are tough decisions, but I do believe my children received a, a very well-rounded, uh, excellent educational opportunity here in, in Exeter. So thank and you for all you've done. To mention the, the school your sister, your daughter, goes to? Uh, she goes to Villanova. Thank She's uh, studying chemical <laughs> engineering. That's right. I think you ought to mention the other two schools. That <laughs> yeah, one in Bloomsburg, uh, with Mr. Japina. <laughs> Uh, one heading to the south, but again, thank you for everything. I know the tough, tough choices. They, they've had a, a great time here, and, and I thank you for all you've done. And uh, any staff members here, I thank you as well for your support. Thank you. Okay, that's it. Um, everybody, thanks for coming out. Good night. Somebody said goodbye, Sharon. Goodbye, Sharon. Sorry, Sharon. I didn't want to say anything. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
are you? I've been meaning to come all year, so I caught the last meeting. I'm going to say I just wanted to say thanks. I don't need to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 